Okay, hello everyone, and thank you for logging in today. My name is Michael Downey, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on targeted manipulation of vine balance. I'd also like to welcome today's presenter, Dr. Everard Edwards from the CSIRO. Everard started his career in the UK with a Bachelor of Science in Plant Sciences at the University of Sheffield, followed by a PhD at Nottingham Trent University in 1997. He then undertook postdoctoral fellowships at the University of York and the Australian National University. Since 2006, Everard has been applying his experience of whole plant physiology to viticulture at CSIRO, leading projects on wine grape management, including investigating the role of vine balance, the long-term impact of deficit irrigation, the role of rootstocks in driving water use efficiency and the interaction between temperature and water status during heat waves. In today's webinar, Everard will discuss manipulating vine balance through leaf area or crop load adjustments and the impact this has on berry and wine composition. But before I hand over to Everard to tell us more, a couple of quick notes on what to expect for those that are new to AWRI webinars. The format for today is a short PowerPoint style presentation followed by a Q&A. We do encourage attendees to get involved and interact. So to ask a question, please type into the questions pane of your control panel in the bottom right corner of your screen. For those with access to a microphone or anyone that's dialed in on a telephone, there's also the option of speaking directly with us by clicking the raise hand button. This is located in the top left section of your control panel. Questions will be answered at the end of the session, but please feel free to send through your questions at any stage. Okay, I'm now going to hand over to Everard to get us started. Okay, um, thanks for attending. So uh, when we're talking about or thinking about vine balance, um, one of the first questions I guess I had when I was first introduced to the concept is what exactly is it? How do we define it? And it's very much a fuzzy concept. Um, and at one extreme, you know, a, a vineyard manager or winemaker can can say a vine is in balance uh, simply because it's giving them, you know, what they want for their their product. Um, and from the other, it could be a very uh, simple uh, ratio measured in the field. So a very broad definition is that a vine is in balance when it has enough shoot to ripen the crop. <clears throat> now essentially, vine balance is a, what we call a source-sink relationship, um, where the carbon that is being fixed from the atmosphere through photosynthesis in the leaves is the source, so it's the source of the energy, and the crop itself and its requirement for that carbon as sugar is the sink for that carbon. So it's a relationship between the source and the canopy and the sink in the fruit. So if we um, want to measure vine balance, therefore what we need to know is how much uh, carbon that vine is going to fix over the season um, and how much carbon is required um, to, to ripen the, the crop, the fruit that are on there. So we need to estimate um, both that potential photosynthesis and the potential yield, really. Now, when we think about the photosynthesis of the vine, that whole vine photosynthesis is a function of many things, um, uh, the, such as the canopy area, the density of the canopy, the light environment it's grown in, the climate it's growing in, the nutrition provided, the water in the soil, um, the soil type itself, and, and so on. So, of those factors, many of them are fixed, particularly within a vineyard block, or they're not controllable, such as um, the light environment and, um, and the climate. So the, the biggest variable there then in that case is really the, um, is the canopy size. So when we define vine balance, we're normally using some kind of metric for vine vigor. Um, typically that's either the size of the canopy or it's the pruning weight where the pruning weight is really being taken as a surrogate for canopy size. So for the work that we've been doing, um, because we can measure canopy size, and because the relationship between canopy size and pruning weight does vary from season to season, um, we've been measuring canopy size directly and using that. So why are we actually interested in vine balance? And 
I guess there's two parts to that. The first one is we, we need the vine to be balanced enough that we can actually ripen the crop that we're growing. And secondly, um, we might be uh, trying to adjust or to control vine balance to obtain a desired fruit um, composition. And it was that uh, latter part in particular, I think, that um, led the uh, Wine Australia um, back in 2012 to fund a couple of projects um, to re-examine this relationship uh, within Australian viticulture. So one of those was a project being run by uh, the University of Adelaide and the other one is the one that I'm talking about today and that's a collaborative project between CSIRO and the National Wine and Grape Industry Centre over in Wagga Wagga. So our project had three uh, main aims I guess. Um, we wanted to uh, replicate multiple vine balance adjustments across different regions, so that is to basically do exactly the same thing in different regions and environments and see whether we get the same results. Secondly, um, we wanted to do a separate, separate part of that work where we actually uh, are adjusting the carbon availability um, within the vine to that fruit independently of the bunch environment. So in the field, um, most of the manipulations we do uh, are also altering the environment of the bunch, not just um, the availability of um, carbohydrate. And thirdly, we wanted to look for potential direct effects of changing vine balance on uh, fruit composition. So for that component, we're using molecular techniques to look at the expression of specific genes um, around uh, anthocyanins and tannins and whether we can see um, the expression of those changing. That gene expression um, is correlated with the amount and activity of protein that is uh, the enzyme that's actually synthesizing those compounds within the berry. So most of the work I'm going to talk about is um, this, this field sites and the field work that we were doing and so we set up three field sites um, in three different, one in each of three states. So all of these have um, Shiraz uh, as the scion. They were all planted in the 1990s. Two of those are on their own route, and the third one is on Schwarzman. So those three were Cleggett Swines down in Langhorne Creek, um, Wingara Wine Group's Deakin Estate over in Sunraysia in Victoria, and McWilliams Wines Barwang uh, Vineyard in New South Wales Hilltops. So across those three sites, we set up a replicated field trial um, in an existing box, to say, in each one of those, and we imposed five treatments, and that was run over three seasons consecutively. So the first treatment that we uh, put in place was simply to uh, monitor the um, vineyard uh, management and um, do nothing at all. So that's our control treatment, um, treatment one, or T1, that you can see in blue there. The second treatment was an early defoliation uh, treatment, and um, that one you can see is treatment two in uh, red there. The third one was a crop thinning treatment, um, perhaps the, the, the simplest uh, to impose and the adjustment of vine balance most commonly in, imposed during the season already. Fourthly, a late defoliation, and then fifthly, a minimal prune uh, treatment. So I'll come back to talk about those treatments again in just a moment. But first of all, um, as you might expect, we've got some, we aim to get different climates um, across those three field sites. So when we look at some actual climate data, and this, is, this was taken during the first uh, season of work that we did within the project, um, on the top right we can see the monthly air temperature, and so we can see there are some differences between those three sites. So the uh, New South Wales site, um, labelled as Wingara on this figure, had the um, warmest uh, sort of spring and autumn and maintained a warm and dry summer. Um, the Langhorne Creek site uh, also had a fairly warm spring and autumn um, and had a slightly cooler average temperature over the summer due to lower night temperatures and um, was also had a slightly higher humidity um, with the sea breezes and so on coming on from that. And then finally the Barwang site um, also had a warm and dry summer um, but tended to have much cooler spring and autumn than the, um, the Victorian site at Wingara. Obviously we get season to season differences, so the, the data you can see there from 2013-14 season is fairly typical. 
But for instance, if we look at the air temperature in 2014-15, which you may remember was a bit different, um, which I've now put there on the top right, we can see quite a different shape to that and some uh, differences in um, the relationships uh, between those sites. So we certainly get variation. So in terms of the treatment, um, all of these vines were um, uh, basically sort of Australian sprawl, um, either a single or double cordon. Um, and as I say, the control T1 treatment um, was just the site standard practice, which we didn't alter. So treatment 2, T2, was the early defoliation. This was done at uh, EL stage 19, which is just prior to CAT4. And so what that treatment involved was, by hand, pulling off all of the fully expanded leaves. So this would be 80% or so of the uh, leaf area at that point. Um, the intention of this treatment was based on um, quite a bit of work that's been done using this technique uh, over in Europe, in um, France, uh, sorry, in uh, Italy in, uh, in particular. And the idea of that is that by removing all of those leaves, we reduce the carbohydrate available to the inflorescences during uh, fruit set and thereby reduce the yield. But due to additional growth and lateral growth, we end up with very little change in canopy area. So the, by doing that, we reduce the amount of yield uh, per unit canopy, or at least that's what um, has been run uh, over in Italy. So the next treatment, the third treatment, is the crop removal. So this is obviously fairly standard. So we basically went out and, um, again, it was done by hand though, we went out and assessed the numbers of bunches on vines across each of our field sites. And we then removed, rather than count the bunches on every single vine, we, we took an average and then we removed half of that average bunch number from every vine um, within our replicate. So we would expect from that that we, because we'll get some compensation by the remaining fruit, that we would have quite a significant impact on yield, but we wouldn't expect um, a half, uh, you know, half yield. So the fourth treatment was a late defoliation treatment, and uh, the idea of this obviously is to again reduce the amount of carbohydrate available um, without impacting uh, the amount of crop. And so that was simply uh, a summer hedging where we tried not to um, impact the fruiting zone itself, but to remove around about half the canopy by cutting the, hedging the canopy back towards the uh, fruiting zone. And again, you can see some photographs there of the amount of leaf um, that was removed from those sites. So this and the crop removal treatment were both done at EL stage 32, um, which is just prior to uh, Varese Finally, there was the minimal pruning treatment, uh, T5 here, and uh, for this treatment at the end of the first season, the 13-14 season, we left um, the vines unpruned and then simply prior to bud burst uh, went and trimmed off the very ends of low-hanging canes so that they weren't growing uh, right down to the ground. So on that top left picture, you can see a picture from the South Australian Langorn Creek um, site with the amount of cane uh, that was left there and um, below that you can see um, at the Victorian site um, bud burst there with um, shoots growing from all of those um, buds and then finally on the right hand side uh, there's an idea of the amount of growth um, quite early in the season uh, pre-flowering. So we then went uh, into each of these vineyards after we'd imposed the treatment and we obviously want to measure vine balance, which, as I mentioned, we're basically defining the relationship between yield and canopy size because we can measure the canopy size. So um, I have the data in this table that you can see here. Um, this is each of those numbers is an average of the whole all three seasons to remove some of that season to season variability. Well, there is variation um, within those seasons. So we have the components of the vine balance, which is the canopy size and the yield, and then the ratio between the two. So we're using the kilograms of yield per unit meter squared of, of canopy within, the, within those vines. So just to note that the minimal prune, because that was only imposed at the end of the first season, and the end of the second season, the vines were in a big adjustment 
phase, so we only did measurements on the minimal prune treatment uh, in the final and third season of work. So there's quite a few numbers on there, so to make life a bit easier, um, I've colour-coded um, those cells, so if it's in blue, um, that value is decreased, if it's in red, it's increased, and the depth of colour, uh, the strength of that colour gives you an indication of um, whether it's increased or decreased by uh, a large amount or not. So if we consider the, uh, this is relative to control of course, so if we consider the um, early defoliation uh, treatment first, um, although in the Italian work, um, typically there was no major impact on canopy size, you can see that if you look at the canopy size of all three sites averaged across three seasons, they're all blue, so we do have a reduction in canopy size. And I think that's because these are, the vines that we're using are all um, sprawl vines where the canopy is typically uh, has only a minimal, perhaps summer trimming um, and very little control through the season, whereas past work in this has been done in um, VSP vines uh, over in Europe where there's probably quite a lot of um, manual adjustment um, through the season. So although we weren't intending to get a major drop in uh, canopy size, we did get a small drop um, at all three sites. On the other hand, um, we also got uh, only a small drop in yield, so we didn't see drops in yield, which were in Italy were 30 to 50 percent, um, anywhere near as high. We only saw a small drop. So when we look at the vine balance then, um, rather than universally getting uh, much less yield per uh, meat squared of canopy as um, was occurring over in Italy, which would be a dark blue colour on these cells, we actually have very little difference. So you can see the, the, these three cells there are either white or very pale in colour, um, so they're quite close to the control. So what we've done is reduce the canopy size and the yield, um, but actually ended up with very little difference in vine balance, quite similar to the control. So it's a useful treatment, but not quite what we expected in the beginning. <clears throat> Okay, so the next treatment is the crop thinning treatment. Um, as you would expect, we've had, um, we've not directly impacted the canopy size. So that pale um, pink you can see on the Victorian site and the pale blue on the New South Wales site, these differences are not statistically significant and so it gives you an idea of the kind of natural um, range that we, uh, we observe. On the other hand, the blue, uh, the yield data there are all very much in the blue. And what that gives us is a vine balance at the end, which, as we would expect, is much lower than the control. So we have less fruit per unit uh, canopy size. So moving on to the late defoliation treatment, the summer pruning. Um, again, we can see we've tried to have no impact on the yield. Actually, at the Victorian site, um, because this is a high production double cordon, uh, system. Um, we did get a small impact on yield because we accidentally removed a few bunches in trying to cut that canopy back, but uh, the other two sites there was uh, no impact on yield. The canopy size, as we'd expect, we reduced uh, significantly. So what we then get is uh, an increase in our vine balance number because we've reduced the canopy size but not the yield, so we get a higher yield uh, per unit um, uh, area of uh, canopy. So finally, the minimal pruning. Um, this was quite mixed and a bit all over the place, and you can see we've got different responses there. And I think that's be probably because uh, even though we were in, did our measurements in the second year after the minimal prune was imposed, those vines were actually still in a, an adjustment phase. And how far through that adjustment uh, they'd gone did depend um, which site they were at and maybe on how many re what reserves were in the vines and the management system and so on. So I think uh, one of the things though that's interesting here is we've done the same uh, manipulations of uh, canopy and crop um, at three quite different sites. We've got the South Australian site that is uh, tends to be hot uh, during the day but cooler at night in the summer, the Victorian site that's uh, uh, quite warm day and night and quite high production, and then we've got the New South Wales site um, which is uh, a cooler, much cooler climate, high altitude um, site. But despite the differences in those sites, we basically got the same response um, uh, in vine balance, which of course is what we were hoping to get, 
um, across all three sites. So we don't have any major differences uh, excluding the minimal prune response. So we would affect um, our ratio, expect sorry our ratio between uh, canopy size and crop to have an impact on the duration of the maturation period, the speed of maturation. And so this figure here uh, shows that impact. So just to be clear that this is expressed as days of advancement uh, from control of maturation. That was defined as uh, 24 degrees bricks. Um, and so if it's a positive number, that means they were that many, they were ripe that many days prior to the control, and if it's a negative number, they were ripe that many days after the control. So the control itself is obviously zero on the on the left hand side of there. And then when we look at the T2, where we saw uh, that was the early defoliation, where we saw just a slight adjustment in vine balance, and that was dependent on site. And so we can see on average over the three seasons, we've only had a very small impact on the um, maturation period uh, with no effect at the Victorian site, um, uh, just one day at the South Australian site and three days at the New South Wales site uh, averaged across those seasons. On the other hand, when we look at the crop removal treatment where we've significantly reduced the crop per unit of canopy, we've reduced the vine balance number, we can see that um, we have a, a more rapid maturation period at all three sites, albeit at the South Australian site, only a very small, diff, only a small increase. Um, the other two sites are much larger, uh, in, increase, uh, sorry, decrease in maturation period. So moving on to the uh, summer pruning treatment, the T4 treatment, where we've moved vine balance in the opposite direction. We've got much more uh, yield per unit of canopy from Verizon through to. Uh, to um, harvest, and there we see the opposite effect, of course, where we have a delayed maturation period, a longer maturation period, and all three sites um, have quite a large, um, uh, uh, quite a large number of days uh, additional ripening required to get the fruit ripe. And finally, the minimal prune, um, as we saw, that varied from site to site, and that's true also the maturation period, and of course, the minimal prune treatment there is only based on a on a single season. So basically, as we would expect, if we move that vine balance, that ratio between crop and canopy significantly, um, we have quite a big effect on the maturation period. And that's true of all of our sites, um, irrespective of uh, climate or yield. So in terms of berry composition, what did we see um, there? Did We've, we can see that we've changed the maturation period quite a lot, but have we actually changed the berry composition as a result of that? So the left of these two figures here is um, the anthocyanins um, in the fruit, and the right is the tannins. So the tannin number is just a total tannin for the, for the fruit, so that's skin tannins and seed tannins um, uh, combined. And these were relatively simple lab uh, measures. So uh, looking at that, um, T2, that early defoliation where the vine balance was similar with only a small effect on maturation period. So we can see that um, at one site in South Australia we have a small but statistically significant um, increase in, in berry colour um, as a result of that treatment, but there's no effect um, at the other two sites. So overall, very little effect. When we think about, look at the uh, crop removal treatment where we've removed um, half of the bunches and had quite a big impact on, on the yield. Um, we can see that we've had no effect at all on the berry anthocyanins that we measure. They're all exactly the same, um, averaged over two seasons. And I should just note that um, at the time preparing this talk, uh, the third season is analyzed, but isn't, the data's not been combined with this yet. And then finally, on to the the summer pruning treatment. Now, this is the pruning treatment. This, this is the treatment where we've actually slowed down maturation. So, if we think about um, a lot of work at the moment, people are aiming to re reduce, uh, to slow maturation in order to um, uh, reduce the effects of climate change in terms of that shortening the maturation period. When we've done that through this summer pruning treatment, um, you can see we've actually decreased the berry anthocyanin, so it's not a very uh, positive effect. 
In terms of the berry tannins, uh, it's uh, much less clear, so um, there's only a small number of uh, real differences and um, they go in different directions, so there's a very small increase in tannins with the late summer pruning in one site but not the other two. Um, a more significant increase in berry tannins um, with that early defoliation treatment, again, uh, well, it's an increase at all three sites, but only statistically significant in one of the, across those two seasons. And uh, obviously, reduction in tannins, uh, the opposite effect in, with that late summer pruning in one of the other treatments. So the tannin story is not clear, um, really, there. So I think uh, one of the things, though, to note here is that particularly that reduction in anthocyanins in the late summer pruning um, is most probably because um, obviously that fruit is more exposed, so it's hotter fruits getting more sun on it, um, and that's probably impacted the anthocyanin synthesis um, in those fruit. So really, it's and the, we also have no impact on the berry colours at all with the 50% crop removal. So that suggests to me, at least, that um, the changes that we do see are more consistent with the changes we've made in the bunch environment with those manipulations than directly as an effect of the maturation rate or the vine balance number. Now obviously we, you know, the wine is what's most important here, so we do um, wine making uh, on all of our treatments and uh, all of our sites. That wine making was done at Charleston University Experimental Winery over in Wagga Wagga, so all the fruit had to be shipped over there by refrigerated transport and see a photograph of some of that being processed uh, on the top left and uh, bottom left. The fermentation was done as 50 kilogram uh, lots in 100 litre variable uh, capacity stainless steel tanks and um, the wine making obviously was a very standard procedure uh, across all of the treatments and all of the sites. So when we look at wine composition, again this is just for two seasons, and again we've taken analogous relatively simple measures here. We've got the wine colour density and the wine uh, uh, total wine um, tannins. So although we didn't see a very uh, consistent impact on um, berry anthocyanins with our T2 treatment, that early defoliation, um, we did see some impact on uh, wine colour density with two of the sites having a significant uh, increase in wine colour density as a result. We also saw um, a small effect of the uh, crop removal treatment, uh, again, which, which we didn't see in the berries at all, where there was no difference in the total anthocyanins there. So this suggests that maybe we've got a difference in the extractability of the um, anthocyanins from that crop removal treatment, or possibly that because of the different maturation period and, and uh, sort of our attempt to harvest everything at the same bricks, um, there um, could be a difference in the uh, pH there, although the wines were pH adjusted. So we do have all that data and we uh, will be over the next few months exploring that um, further. Uh, and then of course we saw that big reduction in uh, universal reduction in anthocyanins with that late summer pruning and that shows up in the wine as well in terms of the wine colour density. So again, looking at the tannins, uh, interestingly, we see a very consistent uh, statistical effect, statistically significant effect of that early defoliation treatment um, on those uh, wine tannins, where in all three sites across those first two seasons, they were on average increased. Um, and we did see that in the berries, but it wasn't statistically significant always in the berries. But then that berry was looking at total berry tannins, not just extractable tannins. So uh, one of the things to note about that result is that um, with our reduction in canopy early in the season, we've got more light on the developing fruit at fruit set and during flowering, um, and so there's a higher exposure there because of that leaf removal. And uh, most of the tannins in the berry are formed at that early uh, period um, around about fruit set and shortly after. So again, this would suggest that we've got an impact there of the change in the environment of the of the bunch, perhaps. Uh, and then um, in terms of the other treatments, um, we've got one small effect in the crop removal, and um, on some of the two of the sites, we had a reduction in the wine uh, tannins in that uh, late foliation. So um, typically what we've seen then is that when we slow down 
that maturation period, in this case through that late summer pruning, um, we're reducing the quality parameters of the wine that we're, we're looking for. And also we see some differences between the berry and the wine that could mean that even though we're not impacting the amount of these compounds in the berries, we're altering the extractability. As I say though, that could also be an artifact of slightly different way um, these fruit have been ripened. So one of the things we wanted to do then um, was to separate out that effect of the bunch environment um, from the effect of the bind balance on the carbohydrate availability um, to that fruit. And so uh, um, an experimental system was set up um, by Jason Smith over at um, uh, Charles Sturt University in Wagga Wagga where we actually, or he actually built chambers um, to surround mature vines in, in pots which were fruiting. And what this chamber allowed us to do was to actually scrub the carbon dioxide from the air. And so it's that carbon dioxide that the vine is fixing through photosynthesis and then providing to the shoot to the fruit as sugars. So by reducing the carbohydrate, uh, reducing the carbon dioxide um, in the air, we reduce the carbohydrate availability to the fruit. So this simulates that T4 treatment, that late that summer pruning treatment. Um, by reducing the, um, effectively reducing the canopy area um, in terms of the amount of photosynthesis that's occurring, but without having any impact on the bunch environment. So in this case, we've not actually physically removed leaves, so the bunch environment is uh, maintained and is the same both in the control vines and the ones with uh, reduced CO2. So, um, the, some of the fruit from these vines was, um, was sampled um, during the scrubbing period of CO2 scrubbing period where we have that reduced um, photosynthesis, so that reduced carbohydrate availability to the fruit. And what this figure here shows is the time across the bottom there um, during the ripening and um, the soluble solids of the fruit as degrees of bricks um, on the y-axis there. So the very beginning of this um, was prior to the scrubbing going on, and again this, this was aimed at being put in place uh, around about um, Paraison, and you can see the actual period that CO2 was scrubbed, so that period of reduced carbohydrate availability to the fruit uh, marked with a red uh, horizontal bar. So where we start off at the beginning with our control vines and our treated vines, um, basically uh, having exactly the same um, juice soluble solids. As soon as we put that C2 scrubbing period on and reduce that photosynthetic rate by around about half, um, we reduce the rate of sugar uh, accumulation. And so you can see that if you look at the, um, compare the uh, completely white um, circles here with these blue ones during this uh, scrubbing period, that they have a different slope, so we've reduced the maturation rate um, during that uh, period. So at the end of the scrubbing period, um, they were, those vines got normal CO2 again, and so the, that's these uh, uh, circles that are in pink here. And so they then uh, actually have the same rate of accumulation as the vines that were never uh, affected by that CO2 scrubbing. Um, but because they're behind at that period, they take longer to ripen. But they do eventually ripen to the same point and they're then harvested. So as we saw in that uh, T4 treatment in the field, we have a longer maturation period and a slower rate of um, ripening in, with this CO2. So it was simulating um, that impact in the field quite well. Now the interesting thing is when we look at the berry colours and we plot out all of those same uh, data points as uh, total anthocyanins in the fruit against the sugar concentration, you can see that the anthocyanins were held back in exactly the same way that the uh, sugar ripening of the fruit was. So what we get there is absolutely no difference at all in the relationship between the anthocyanins and the sugars in the fruit off those vines that have been subjected to this um, CO2 scrubbing, this simulated uh, leaf removal. Um, and so, as I say, this is, with this system we have no impact on the bunch environment, and when we have no impact on the bunch environment, when we slow the, the ripening down, we see um, no impact on those anthocyanins relative to the sugars. 
So as I mentioned at the beginning, one of the uh, other components of this work is what we wanted to do is to look at the expression of key genes for regulating anthocyanins and regulating tannins and to see whether when we manipulate bind balance and impact carbohydrate availability uh, either up or down to that crop, whether we get differences in those genes which would indicate to us that you know, we've got a direct effect on the synthesis of those compounds within the fruit. So um, this pathway uh, that you can see there just basically shows the pathway where, where the anthocyanins and tannins are produced and the relationships between them and the names of some of the genes. We don't need to worry too much about that. But we've been looking at the expression of some of those genes um, and that work is ongoing um, at the moment um, through this next few months. And so far we've not actually seen any uh, impact of the treatments on uh, direct on, on those genes um, in terms of when the treatments were applied. So applying a leaf removal or applying a crop removal, we don't see any direct and quick effect um, on that gene expression, suggesting that um, the treatment itself is, is not causing a difference, uh, at least in the short term, in the expression of those genes and so probably not in the synthesis of those uh, compounds. But we're still working on that and we will be tracking that uh, over the duration of ripening. So finally, to try and summarize uh, all of that, um, so we you know, utilized canopy and crop management practices and one of the key things is that even though those practices, um, you know, particularly in the higher production Victorian site, would you know, potentially not commonly be used in terms of the leaf removal, um, we actually saw consistent results. So irrespective of yield and irrespective of climate, uh, basically the management practices reduced, uh, produced largely the same impact on uh, the vines, the uh, change in vine balance and on the, the fruit themselves. Secondly, um, I would argue that um, the biggest driver we saw in terms of berry and wine composition was probably the bunch environment um, rather than uh, any changes in vine balance itself or in maturation time. Um, but there was, of course, the, there's the uh, possibility there of you know, secondary impacts maybe on extractability or, or other areas of the, uh, of, of the wine making. Um, so slowing the maturation rate down, albeit we've um, only done that in the field with that um, uh, late leaf removal treatment, did not produce more desirable berries uh, composition or wine composition uh, in those field treatments. In fact, did the reverse. We ended up with, with uh, poorer quality parameters. And when we did that same slowing of maturation under controlled environments with no effect on, in, on the uh, exposure of the fruit um, using that uh, system over at Wagga Wagga, we saw no impact on the um, on the burial wine composition in either direction. So I would argue that um, the primary outcome of the work uh, so far is that um, we're probably better off um, thinking much more about managing the bunch environment quite carefully than we are being greatly concerned with small differences in um, the ratio of, of fruit to canopy size. So finally, I would of course like to acknowledge the wine companies, the vineyards that we worked with, um, especially Brett Cleggett at uh, Cleggett Wines, uh, Belinda Carriage at Craig Thornton at Wingara Wine Group, and Chris Coddington over at McWilliams Wines. Um, wine Australia, of course, for funding this work, and a number of other technical staff helped with uh, some of the field work as well. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Everard. Um, for our listeners, Everard's going to stick around now for some questions. So if you have any questions for him, please start sending them through now. Um, I've noticed we've just got our first one now. Just a quick reminder for anyone that's not familiar, to ask a question, you can type it into the bottom section of your control panel. If you've got a microphone and you want to chat directly with, <coughs> excuse me, with Everard, please click the raise hand button and I will unmute your microphone. Okay, so we've got a question here about um, whether we saw an increase in fruit quality from the trials and whether the wine from the different trials was blind tasted and rated. 
So obviously I've talked a little bit about the um, fruit quality the parameters. So one of the things again that we're doing in the current year, because we're not this is the final year of the project and we're not doing field work at the moment, is to look at the anthocyanins and tannins in much more detail in both the fruit and the wine. So rather than just simply, you know, large total numbers of each, um, which I've just presented, we'll be looking at the composition um, of that as well uh, with more detailed analysis. Don't have those results yet. So in terms of the wine, um, we've done some basic difference testing on some of those wines um, from the first season and I think also now the second season. And um, I, again, I don't have the results on me. My recollection from the first season is the wine that stood out um, was the um, with the difference testing was the um, T2 wine, which is that early defoliation that seemed to result in more tannins in the wine, but it actually was the result of almost no impact on vine balance. Um, when the other thing that we've done in terms of wine tasting and, and testing is we've um, used the McWilliams winemakers each season who've um, blind tasted all of the wines and given us some sensory scores around those wines. So one of the things I didn't mention um, early on is that, should have mentioned earlier on, is that the wine data that I showed is from one month after bottling and we've also done doing 11 month after bottling uh, analysis of the wines too. And what we saw is that uh, particularly the colour differences there um, going from, in, from one month to 11 month after bottling, they've dropped out a fair bit. So there are still some differences, um, but not as, as strong. So uh, in terms of the wines, the winemakers um, certainly pulled out the T4, that late summer uh, prune, that, not late summer, but the summer pruning um, treatment, and yeah, to a lesser extent, the T2. So that was the main uh, effects that they saw, and clearly slight differences too. Okay, thanks for going through that question there. Everard, and thanks for your question, Charles. If you've got any follow-ups or anyone else has any questions before we finish the webinar, please send them through now. Okay, we haven't had any final questions, so I think we'll wrap it up. Um, if you do have any questions, um, Everard's contact details are uh, on the screen there. And as I'm talking, I've just noticed we've got another question. So I'll um, forwarding that to you now, Everard. Okay, so the question is, did I notice any major difference in dropping fruit after raison? Um, I assume you're referring to the crop removal treatment. Um, so we did that just prior to um, raison, as I said, and um, so at the hilltops site, um, as as well, basically in terms of the fruit themselves, we couldn't see any differences in the fruit composition uh, at all, um, even though we dropped the yield by half on those vines, or close to half. Um, we did see, as I said, the small impact on the wine in terms of, um, and the hilltop site was one of the two sites where we had a small improvement in wine colour density shortly after bottling. Uh, I, that difference does tend to decrease as the wines in the bottle um, and so was not uh, picked out by the winemakers when we did the wine tasting or in the difference testing from my recollection. So small differences we can measure in the wine but uh, not perceptible um, to the winemakers. Okay, thanks for your final question there Charles. Um, so we'll finish up now. Um, I'd firstly like to thank Everard for coming in and presenting today. I'd also like to thank everyone who took part in the session and attended. Um, for all attendees, you will receive a follow-up email. Um, within this email, there'll be a link to this recording 
there will also be a link to a survey. Uh, the next AWRI webinar is on the 1st of December, um, where the Bureau of Meteorology's Gary Allen and Joel Lysenby will present a webinar on the seasonal outlook for vintage 2017. Now, if you'd like to register for this webinar and you haven't done so already, please visit the AWRI website. That's all we have for today. Thank you again for attending and I look forward to seeing you at the next AWRI webinar.